opening hymn this morning, Comfort, Comfort, Ye My People, number 347 are up on the screen. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The mighty Lord has done great things, and holy is his name. We thank you, O Lord. The Lord's mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. We adore you, O Lord. The Lord has shown the strength of his arm. We praise you, O Lord. The Lord has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. We worship you, O Lord. We sing.
Lord, let the lighting of these candles signify that you are the light that shines in all the darkness of our lives. As we wait, watch, hope, and pray, guide us all to reflect your light and to let it shine. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Having emerged from the waters of baptism as God's new creation in Christ, we confess our sins to God and to one another. confess to you, O Lord, that we are captive to sin in thought, word, and deed. We have not always been instruments of your peace. Our homes that have at times been places of strife and turmoil, turmoil by our own fault. Even in the church, sometimes we have chosen to fight rather than to make peace. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. And so as a called and ordained servant of Christ, by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. My mouth derides my enemies, because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. The barren has borne seven. But she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and exalts. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Into this world of turmoil, you, O Lord, bring peace. Let the peace that calmed the troubled heart of Mary so rule in our hearts and minds that by your power we may all become peacemakers in our homes, in our community, and in our church, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated. The service of the Word today begins with the Old Testament reading from Micah chapter 5. But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor is given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock, in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. 
And then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the verse and the gospel reading. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will be called blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. The rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Children may come forward for a children's message. Good morning. It is good to see all of you here this morning. <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you about, about one of my favorite Christmas decorations, because I remember when I was your age, I remember that it took forever for Christmas to get here. Do you all ever feel that way? Yeah. So when I would, when I would come to church, I would always look for one thing that would tell me how close Christmas is getting. And that is the Advent wreath over there by, by Pastor Mark. Do you all see that? How many candles are on the Advent wreath? There are four candles on the Advent wreath. And so every week, there, there are four weeks in Advent, in the season of Advent. And so every week we would light another candle and that would say, Christmas is getting closer. So if we look over at the Advent wreath right now, how many candles are lit? There are four candles lit. And you know what that means? That means Christmas is getting really, really, really close. Isn't that exciting? What else do you notice 
about the Advent wreath. Is there anything else that, that strikes you? There is a white candle in the middle. Yeah. Do you know when we light the white candle? We light it on Christmas. And so throughout the whole season of Advent, we light one more candle and one more candle, and the light grows and grows, and that's to help us anticipate the growing light as Christ comes to us as a little baby. And so that is really exciting. So, so every time that you come into church during Christmas season, you can always look at the Advent, can at the Advent wreath, and you know that Christmas is coming, and that helps you anticipate the excitement of Jesus coming to be with us. So I would invite you to please pray with me and you can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for coming down to earth and being the light of the world. Help me to go out into the world and be this light to other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome, thank you. You can return to your seats. Grace to you and peace from God our Father through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Having a baby is an exciting time. When you see those two pink lines or when you see that baby on the ultrasound for the first time, it is this overwhelming sense of joy, of excitement, of anticipation. But not all mothers, not all parents feel that way when they get the news that they are pregnant. To some, that news comes with fear and anxiety, and they are laden with all sorts of questions. 
what will people think of me? How will I provide for this child? What will our future look like? This news, in other words, brings chaos. And if you've ever had the latter experience when you've found out about being pregnant, then you can relate to Mary in our gospel reading for this morning. You see, Mary's pregnancy announcement was, was not announced with, with two pink lines or, or by a doctor coming to her. No, the angel Gabriel came and told her that she would be pregnant. But despite this holy announcement, this exciting way of finding out that she would be pregnant, Mary was not excited. Instead, she received that news with fear and trepidation because Mary was a poor peasant woman. And that meant that her life was filled with a lot of uncertainty about what the future might hold. But she had one thing going for her. She was betrothed to Joseph. And betrothal is, is really a lot more than engagement. Betrothal is this contract between two families that their children would be married. And so Mary had this to look forward to, and it, and it gave her life a sense of stability. But now that the angel Gabriel had brought her this news that, that she would be pregnant out of wedlock, it threw her life into chaos. What would her future husband think? Would he di divorce her? Would he publicly shame her? Would she be socially outcast? How would she care for this new child? But Mary does something remarkable. Despite all of these questions, Mary courageously responds to the angel Gabriel with this, with this humble statement of faith. And she says, Behold, I am the bond servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And Mary says this, and in spite of the chaos that has just been thrust into her life as an unwed mother, she knows that she is ruined socially, that she is ruined relationally. So she, but yet she submits. But she submits without joy. She doesn't sing. There, there is no peace. She is in this state of confused submission. I think you all know what this confused submission looks like. If you can think back to a time in your life, perhaps even right now, in which you have had to endure some great prolonged trial or some difficulty or some tragedy, you don't know why, but yet you faithfully and humbly submit to God's plan. I was talking with a friend of mine not too long ago who has for years now been subjected to a severe nerve pain. And this nerve pain has been so severe and so prolonged that, that it has ruined her entire life and it is even now starting to cause her to lose her own eyesight. And every time we talk, she always expresses this sense of confusion. Why? Why is this happening? Why can't I live my life normally? But she always ends our conversation with a bold statement of faith. God's will be done. He has a plan. I trust in him. It is a bold statement of faith. It, it is a good image of this confused submission. And our gospel reading actually picks up with Mary in this state of confused submission. And so she decides to act on the only other information that, that she has at the time. You see, the angel Gabriel also told her that her relative Elizabeth was experiencing a similar miracle. Her relative Elizabeth had been barren her entire life. And yet, even though she was too old to have children, 
she too was six months pregnant. In a sense, the angel is prodding Mary. Go see Elizabeth. And so Mary acts on this little piece of information. She hopes for some answers. And our text says that she goes with haste. She runs. She flees to Elizabeth. But you have to know that this would have been a several day long journey of at least 50 miles that she travels on foot. And you know that that whole time that she's thinking about these things. She's in this state of confused submission. She doesn't know that she's pregnant. She can't feel the baby, but she has received this message from the Lord. And so she's, she's faithfully percolating through all of this information. And then finally, when she bursts through the door into Elizabeth's house, she isn't ready for the words that greet her. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And she's able to interpret this, this, this common movement of the baby. Every mother knows what that's like, knows what that's like, that the baby leaps in her womb. And because Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, she's able to interpret this as a sign. You might think of it as John the Baptist's first prophecy. And so Elizabeth sees Mary, feels her baby leap in her womb, and she says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And Mary can't believe it. This is the same Mary who is so poor that when she has to take Jesus to the temple to be dedicated, she can't afford the lamb that, that God requires for that sacrifice. Instead, she can only afford, her and Joseph can only afford those two pigeons. This is the same Mary who is a social outcast because she's been pregnant out of wedlock. The same Mary who's a nobody is called blessed among women and the mother of my Lord. Do you see how amazing how shocking that prophecy is. Elizabeth doesn't even know, can't even see that Mary is pregnant, but yet she has faith. She believes, and she not only knows that Mary is pregnant, but she knows who Mary is carrying, the Son of God. And she also knows about Mary's humble faith. And when Mary hears this prophecy, this confirmation of everything that she's been worried about, stewing about for the last week, her confused submission turns into this joyful reality. See, that confusion is gone, and it is now replaced with joy and clarity. Mary can finally experience that excitement that, that mothers get to experience when they find out they're pregnant for the first time. And this prompts Mary to sing. Mary sings the first ever Christmas carol. It's what is contained at the end of our gospel reading. We call it the Magnificat. But notice what it took for Mary to get to that moment. Mary, when she receives that message from the angel Gabriel, she doesn't just sit alone at her home stewing about how her life has been thrust into chaos. She doesn't walk around with pride because she has been visited by an angel and tapped out by God to, to be the mother of the Lord. No, Mary seeks out community. She seeks out Elizabeth. And only in the company of Elizabeth, only in that community, does Mary fully realize the promise that she has received. Only in that community is her confused submission turned into joyful reality. And this fact is, is what makes our faith, our Christian faith, so countercultural. Our faith is not something that, that can be contained on this one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Our, our faith is, is meant to be shared. In fact, our faith depends on the people that are sitting around us. 
Let me give you an example of, of what this dependence looks like. C.S. Lewis uh, had, a, had a small group of, of friends that, that were really close. And in the mid-40s, one of his friends named Charles Williams died. And in his book on the four loves, Lewis is commenting on, on everything that he had lost when his friend Charles died. He said, when Charles died, I didn't just lose Charles, but I also lost a part of my friend Ronald that, that only Charles brought out. Lewis goes on to write, and in each of my friends there is something that only some other friend can fully bring out. By myself, I am not large enough to fully call out a man's activity. I want other lights than my own to show all his facets. Lewis's point is that each and every one of you are so complex, your personality is so multifaceted that in order to be fully known, you belong and need to be in a community. And if this is true for each and every one of you, how much more is this true when we peer into the identity of Jesus Christ. Jesus knows that we need this Christian community because each and every one of you have the ability to admire a different aspect of who Jesus is. And each one of you have a different ability to live that aspect of Jesus out in your life. And so God knows this. And so he brings this community together and he promises to come to us through this community. And that's why God comes to us through our community. And, and I don't think that it's, it's possible for me to overstate the importance of this point. Because far too often we have, we have coalesced to what the world says about our I individual identity. And we have tried to make our Christian faith fit that. In other words, we have said, as long as I read my Bible on my own every now and then, as long as I, as I try to pray, everything's okay. But this isn't what Mary says and what Mary does. Mary needed the confirmation that she found in community with Elizabeth. And this is why we should be careful and, and hesitant about, about other theologies that, that place a high importance on this personal conversion experience that, that says, I need to do this little thing on my own so, so that I know what I have is real. Do you see how isolating that is? Do you see how confusing that is? It's, it's kind of like us all being stranded out in the middle of the ocean on the same raft. We all have a paddle in our hand, and we are all paddling in different directions. If we're merely a group of, of individuals that, that gathers together, it gets us nowhere. It's confusing, and, and we are locked into that state of confusion. But notice that, that Elizabeth serves an important purpose as being part of that community. When Mary comes to Elizabeth, Elizabeth doesn't just serve as a counselor to Mary. Elizabeth doesn't just say, it'll be okay, you're fine, everything's going to be fine. Those words of encouragement are important and helpful. But it is Elizabeth who is filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, when Mary comes in that door, what she sees, what she experiences, is the presence of God in her life. And that confirms what, what she has already heard, what she has already believed, and that changes and, and shapes her faith. So the point is, when you come here, you don't just come to receive encouragement from one another, although it is nice. You come here to be in the presence of one another, to be in the presence of those who are baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit. You are the presence of God to one another and one another's lives.
In other words, you are Elizabeths to one another. But that doesn't mean that, that we should just walk around with, with pride and arrogance that, that, that we have been given this gift of the Holy Spirit. And it also doesn't mean that we can isolate ourselves as, as, being, uh, as just having this one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. What this looks like is living like Mary in this state of, of humility. Just like Mary entered into Elizabeth's house, when she came through that door, she was humbly looking for some confirmation about what she had heard and experienced. She was looking for some corroboration about what she had seen. And God gladly gave that to her. He didn't hold back. Elizabeth said also to Mary, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And this is the blessing that we also receive from the pastor as from God himself. This is the blessing that we have to give to one another. When we come here, we are encouraged that the faith that we have is steadfast, that the struggles that we endure, we endure together, that the coming of Christ is coming soon. And so as we gather, we receive this renewed sense of joy, like, like a mother who finds out for the first time that she is pregnant. We experience that excitement, that overwhelming sense of joy, and it prompts us into song, our own Christmas carol. So we can sing with Mary, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on our humble estate and has called us blessed. He who is mighty has done great things for us. Holy is his name. Amen. We stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We sing Create in Me as our offering is brought forward.
prepare our hearts and minds for Christ's coming, we turn to the Lord in prayer. O wisdom from on high, grant us peace. Move the leaders, pastors, teachers, and all the people of our synod to be peacemakers, we pray. Hear us, coming Lord. O desire of nations, bless the leaders of nations, our president and Congress, our governors and local leaders. Move all leaders to cease envy and boastfulness, injustice and corruption, Guide our leaders to be honorable people who do not neglect the poor and who strive toward the flourishing of all human beings. Bless those who serve in our armed forces and lift up refugees and all victims of war. Bring peace between us and our enemies and let your peace reign over this broken world. We pray, hear us coming Lord. O day spring from on high, come to the aid of all who are in need. As you humbly entered this world as a vulnerable baby, help all of us humbly to enter the lives of those who are sick, facing surgery or dying, to offer comfort and hope. We lift up especially before you for healing today, Valerie Blizzard, Robin Harris Dubs, Scott Keen, Andrea Hendricks, Mike McCovens, Nathan Chase, Ricky Vicky Young. Bring healing according to your will and peace to those whose suffering endures. Thank you for the work of doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals who work toward healing and restoration of wholeness. Guide scientists searching for cures for diseases that bring suffering to the world, that their work may lead to healing for many. We pray. Hear us, coming Lord. O Key of David, let your peace flow freely in and among the families of this congregation. Empower parents and grandparents to love their children and children to love their parents. Watch over all who travel and comfort families who are separated by many miles. Guide families to be places where your love is demonstrated to strangers as well as to friends. We pray, hear us coming Lord. O Lord of might, let the peace that surpasses human understanding, the peace that comes from being in Christ, so fill our hearts that we become signs of your peace in this chaotic world. We pray, hear us coming, Lord. O Emmanuel, you deliver your people even from the grip of death. Comfort those who mourn, especially Dick and Jean Hatz, and their family at the death of Dick's brother, Paul. Use us to express the hope that comes from trusting in you. Bring us to be with them on that great day to come. And until that day, give us grace to endure life's difficulties while also abiding in your love. We pray, hear us coming, Lord. And Lord, we also rejoice with those who rejoice among us with Paul and Mary Campafter and their whole family at the baptism of their granddaughter, Emmy Lou. Uh, we pray that you would raise, would cause parents to raise uh, this uh, child of yours uh, to know, love, worship, and serve you. You, O oh Lord, know the thoughts of our hearts and hear those prayers that come to you in sighs too deep for words. All our prayers we entrust to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The Lord has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham 
and to his offspring forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing. Thank you.